I think you continue with the okay. industrial relation act because it's okay. actually very relevant. Yeah, yeah, okay, no problem. So uh, I have introduced to all of you the background of the industrial relation act uh, just now, a moment ago. So there are some key amendments to this uh, piece of law uh, and has came into force on 1st of January 2021. So what are the uh, amendments? So there's an amendment at section 8 sub 2 in respect of the reference of complaint to industry court. The DGIR, Director General of Industry Relation, is no is not required to notify the minister and may refer complaints in relation to the protection of right of workmen and employer and their trade union directly to the industrial court for hearing. So previously, the DG will still have to notify the minister of any complaint and, then, and the minister will have to decide whether to refer the case to the industrial court for hearing. So now there's no such requirement and it saves a lot of time. So uh, the next amendment is the at the section 20 in respect of the representation on dismissal. So for those uh, employees who have been unfairly dismissed, they can actually um, make a representation under section 20 and the Director General of Industrial Relations shall directly refer the representation, we call it a uh, complaint, a complaint actually, uh, on a workman's dismissal to the industrial court. There is no requirement to notify the minister first. The power of uh, referring the representation on a workman dismissal has been conferred to the DGIR. So same, it saves a lot of hassle and time. So uh, there is this amendment to section 30, interest on award. So whatever award awarded by the industry court shall now carry interest at 8% per annum. The interest is imposed on the 31st day from the date the award is made until the award is specified. So um, please comply with the award of the industry court, otherwise there would be an interest imposed. So uh, for the last, I think, uh, yeah, last second. So in respect of the appeal against an award, if any one of you uh, is not satisfied with the decisions or the award of the industrial court, then they can actually now appeal to the high court. Previously, the challenge of uh, an industrial court award is by way of judicial review. So by going through judicial review, it actually is, it's a painful procedure. Because for judicial review, we have to go through two stages. There are two stages of applying for judicial review. First, you have to apply for a leave. We call it permission. A permission in order to apply for judicial review. After you obtain the leave, the permission to apply for judicial review, only you can apply for judicial review. So this is quite um, time consuming. So now the challenge can be by way of an appeal. So I have done a lot, actually it really uh, save a lot of time and a lot of hassle because we don't have to obtain a permission from the court to appeal again the decision of the industrial court. So uh, the last one is the amendment at section 60, the general penalty. So anyone who contravenes with any regulation under the Industrial Relations Act, the penalty is 50K, increase from 5K. So this is a huge uh, increment. So uh, I have uh, finished the key amendments to both uh, Employment Act and also Industrial Relations Act. So uh, Agnes, uh, yeah. I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Thank no you, problem. Jerry. Yeah. So, la ladies and gentlemen, isn't it sweaty hands, you know, when you listen to all these amendments? I'm an employer myself. Huh? I'm an employer myself. I know how tough this is. To be very honest with you, for today's sessions, sometimes I was selecting 
select some staff who need to actually maybe do some advice to actually join our Coffee on Zoom as part of their internal training. But for this particular session, I actually make it very restrictive because I, I believe, right, there will be a lot of conversations that is employer-driven, not that we employer trying to do anything, but we have concern and our concern come with business costs, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very important slide. Uh, of all slides, this is a very important slide. Please take it down so that you keep in touch with Jerry. Um, this is not the first time I do a coffee on Zoom with Jerry. The last time that we did was during the pandemic, like what, yeah, two years ago? Yeah, few years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. two years. Ma still many years remember ago. me, eh, Agnes. Yes, I do, I do. I always yeah. remember good thank you, and, thank you. Uh, good and uh, how to call value add contact, uh, you, you, you know, you, in order you. to assist my client for. <laughs> no now, um, I can see that there are like a screening of uh, uh, questions here and there. So, uh, Jerry, allow us to do it this way. Uh, we go through some of the slides because I believe by us going through the, the slides one more time by questions, right, we won't have actually answered some of those questions, bits and pieces. No I would like to actually look at slide number nine. Yeah, number is it okay nine. that you go to slide number nine for, for me? And I no believe I, by, by yes. having that, I will be answering some of the questions in the audience. Yes, uh. yes, yes. Now, there is this thing about hospitalization. I see people ask about how huh, hospitalization, you know, like sick leave will be abused, things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, before we go into the abuse conversation, now what is the meaning of hospitalizations? Huh? Uh, if a doctor issue uh, a written instruction to a patient uh, that he or she needs to stay at home and rest, is that instruction resulted in uh, which is resulted in absence from work? Does it come under sick leave or hospitalization? So now, uh, this this question may be a little bit of a practical thing. So I will get my my HR. Uh, Marcus Ling to actually uh, unmute and maybe answer this particular question because I see there are this confusion. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that now the 60 days hospitalization leave is not inclusive of the sick leave. So hence, as a as an employer, we have we are actually having extra uh, uh, obligation. Uh, we have extra obligation in giving more perks back to our staff. So yeah. Marcus, just wanted to hear from you. Okay, that's nice. Okay, uh, for our practical, this will be deep as the hospitalization leave because uh, for example, today I uh, just uh, get injury in my company. So uh, daughter give me, give me a one month uh, rest in home. Then this will uh, be the hospitalization leave because I need to take a long period to uh, recover my uh, medical uh, uh, the the body etc. Et so you yeah, will so, be hospitalization. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, when you see an MC moving forward, uh, it doesn't mean that goes straight to sick leave, you know. It doesn't mean that uh, your staff is sitting and, and resting in a hospital, then only hospital hospital leave comes into the picture now. You know, so we are talking about I think one of our participants also mentioned that particular para in the act that actually says that including outpatients uh, resting treatment. So if All there right. is a adjoining situations, it actually does come under the hospitalization leave, right? And it's not like, oh, you know what? You have already fully deducted the sick leave. Then now it come under unpaid. It doesn't work like that. So please take note of that. Huh? Yeah, so, um, okay. I would like to go to, okay, is, is there anything on the sick leave, yeah, uh, Marcus or Cyrus, that we wanted to dealt with at the same time? Because I see the questions keep popping up. Some on hospitalization, some on sick leave. Have, have we answered everything on the sick leave matters? Yeah, Marcus, are you are muted at the moment. Okay. Uh, so far, no, for my side. <laughs> Uh, meaning, meaning whatever that was actually uh, asked here is actually uh, being being put down, right? Yeah, I already answered in the chat room, so uh, I think uh, so far uh, it's clear. So far, yeah, okay. Yeah. For any of the participants, if anything on this thing about sick leave and hospitalizations, right? You want, in case we have not actually answered your questions, would you like to actually post it one more time? Huh? So uh, there is this question, okay, employee take sick leave or hospitalization leave across weekends. Uh -huh. Friday MC, Monday MC. Total number okay. of MC and hospitalization, is it two days or four days? Ah, uh, this is a very important question. 
actually from my understanding in law uh, didn't mention uh, including the rest day or uh, public holiday, but in our practical, we will uh, just deduct two day MC. Mm, yeah. Okay. So uh, this entitlement become a very important thing. Yeah? Uh, hopefully, uh, the participants who actually ask these questions about whether they are two days or four days, your answers uh, meet your, your question is being answered. And uh, But the hospitalization leave include rest day, right? Uh, so there's a question on Kiana Tan. Yeah, it should be because it's continuous. Yeah, so basically yeah. the deductions will basically depending on whether you come under the hospitalization leave or you come under the, the, the sick leave. So, right, Marcus, to, to actually answer Kiana Tan's question. So, yeah. let's, let's just zoom into these issues about sick leave, uh, sick leave and hospitalization leave thing. Uh. So, first thing first, we have to determine, is this a hospitalization issue or is this a sick leave issue? Yeah, so this is actually very important. And there's a question about confirmed stuff. Yeah. Can we deprive the uh, non-confirmed stuff from, uh, you know, sick leave or hospitalization leave per se? Okay, actually still another because uh, in Employment Act, uh, did not mention the probation staff and confirmed staff. It means that when the employee today, uh, first day joined the company, he or she also entitled the uh, sick leave and hospitalization leave. Uh, Jerry, what, yes, if, yes. Uh, what if I... Uh, I put in my company handbook mm. a non-confirmed staff, staff under probation, mm. okay, are mm. not entitled to um, hospitalizations and sick leave. Can I do that to no, overcome no, no, no. the issue? No, actually, we cannot because conf uh, probation, no, we mu it, they must be treated as if confirmed staff. Actually, they deserve the same right as if uh, confirmed staff. So we can treat them differently. Actually, there are a lot of uh, precedent case law saying this, although it's not stated in the Employment Act as Marcus, Marcus uh, just, just mentioned, but they, are, they deserve the same right as confirmed staff. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. And then, um, okay, uh, what, if the, what if the staff utilize all sick leave? Can they start utilizing Hospitalization leave. Wow, this one very changi or this question. <laughs> uh -huh. this question eh? What if staff oh. utilize all sick leave and then after that go and utilize hospitalization leave? Uh, I think it's not so straightforward, right? That is, yeah. I mean. Actually, it cannot. Uh, just unpaid, okay. just unpaid. Mm, yeah. Uh, I agree with that. An, yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, okay. Hospitalization leave or sick leave is not an annual leave. Uh. Ah, uh, it's not an uh, uh yeah, like, they need uh, medical certificate saying the illness require hospitalizations actually. So we cannot simply categorize it as a uh hospitalization leave or sick leave. So you know, yeah. Right, Sorry for, yeah. for interrupting you, uh, Agnes. Yeah. Yes, 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 correct, correct, Jerry. Yeah, 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 you are you are right to actually uh, and thank you very much for that. And then um uh, yeah, so and then there is one uh, interesting question here. 